So we've looked separately at the Sterling numbers of both kinds. We've seen their nice formulas for both of them in special cases, and that they both exhibit nice recurrence relationships. Now I want to talk about the relationship between these two types of numbers. And to do that, it's best to look at them as an array. So here, notice my indexing set goes from 0 to 4. That means that this entry here, it looks like it's in the fifth row and the fourth column, but my indexing is shifted. So this means that that entry 6 is actually S4, 3, which of course we saw the formula is then 4 choose 2, which is indeed 6. And the same thing happens with the indexing over here for Sterling numbers of the first kind. And we remember the there we got a 4 choose 2 as well, but now it's got a negative sign. A negative sign because the Sterling numbers of the first kind have a sign. And part of what I want to talk about right now is why that is. Why don't we just consider the signless variation, which is much more combinatorial? And the reason comes down to the following statement. This is a theorem that you can easily prove by induction. Let's look at what it says. It says that when we multiply Stirling numbers of the second kind with Stirling numbers of the first kind in such a way that these indices match up, we get 0 or 1. What is this type of relationship over here saying? It's saying that if I take this matrix and multiply it by this matrix, that's what we're doing here, matrix multiplication. What do I get? I get the identity. So these two matrices are inverse to one another. And of course, if I have a matrix like I do over here with all positive entries, its inverse is going to have to have negative entries. And that's where in the signs come from. So let's see why that's the case. And I want to talk about a deeper reason. Of course, you can prove this by induction, but I don't think that proof is very enlightening. So I want to go a little deeper and talk about the algebra behind these numbers just so that you can see um, a, little, a little glimpse of how deep this rabbit hole goes. So first of all, let's remember um, the 12-fold way. Recall the 12-fold way that we discussed a while back. Ah, way. Um, what that said, one of the things that it said, is that the number of maps um, from, say, a set of size m number of maps f from a set of size m to a set of size x. Here, think of x as a number, like 12, is x to the m. Why? Because for each of these guys, we choose something to send it to, and we choose that freely. Now, of course, um, we looked at surjective maps. So the number of surjective maps was um, given by the Stirling numbers, so in the formulas, the surjective maps um, came in um, the surjective maps, let's say, from n to k is k factorial s n k. So that was one of the entries in the Stirling numbers. I'm trying not to mess up my notation here, so apologies for that. Um, so what does that tell us? Well, remember that all maps are surjective onto their image, right? So what does that mean? That means that I can actually write x to the m. This is counting all maps. This is equal to the sum over how big is my domain or my range of k factorial s m k. This is just telling me that I hit k k things exactly. So, and then of course I need to choose among the x things that I have to hit, choose k of them to hit. Okay, so this is counting surjective maps. So these guys are the surjective and this is onto k boxes. So we can simplify this. How does this simplify? Well, we can simplify this. This is going to be the sum from k equals 0 to m. Of, and we can multiply the k factorial because x choose k is going to have a k factorial in the bottom. And what do we get? We get s m k x falling factorial k. Why is that interesting? Um, well, think about it like this. We can think of all polynomials as a vector space. And we can think of a basis for the vector space of all polynomials as, well, there's 1, there's x, there's x squared, x cubed, and so on and so forth. Of course, I can write any polynomial as a linear combination of these. There's another basis I could use too. Um, this basis is 1. It's x falling factorial 1. x falling factorial 2. 
x falling factorial 3, and so on. Why? Because each of these guys is still degree i. So x falling factorial 3 is degree 3. So that's also going to give me a basis for polynomials. And what this statement is actually telling me, and maybe I'll write the x down here just so that I have it all in one line, what this statement is telling me is that the Stirling numbers of the second kind are the change of basis matrix to go from basis 2 to basis 1. Now let's do a similar game over here for Stirling numbers of the first kind. So over here, I'm going to give you a claim, and this claim is something you can prove using the recurrence relation for the signless Stirling numbers. So this statement is the sum from n equals 0 to k, c of k n, t to the n is equal to t times t plus 1 times t plus 2 all the way up to t plus n minus 1. I'm oh, sorry, plus k minus 1. So this is something we can prove by induction, and I just want to remind you that the sign, signed Stirling numbers are equal to minus 1 to the k minus n times the signless Stirling numbers, right? That's what we have here. Okay, so take that for granted for a moment, okay? And now what I want you to do is let's change our variables a little bit here. Let's set t equal to negative x. And let's multiply this whole thing by minus 1 to the k. So that's what we're going to do for this claim, okay? I'm going to multiply by minus 1 to the k, and I'm going to set t equal to negative x. And let's see what I get. I get minus 1 to the k, because I've just multiplied by that, the sum from n equals 0 to k, c of kn minus x to the n is equal to minus x, that's what t is, minus x plus 1, all the way up to minus x plus k minus 1. Okay, now let's do some shenanigans and, and kind of fill this out a little bit. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot over here to multiply by minus 1 to the k. There, now I've done it. Okay, so on the left-hand side, what do I get? Well, I'm going to push that minus 1 to the k inside, and I get the sum from n equals 0 to k of minus 1 to the k. Now, notice over here I have a, a minus 1 to the n, so I'm actually going to let that be minus 1 to the minus n. Minus n and n have the same parity, so I'm allowed to do that. Um, c of k n. And what do I get on the right-hand side? Well, I've got my minus 1 to the k. And I'm going to factor out the minus 1s from each of these terms as well. They're k terms, so I get another minus 1 to the k. And now, instead of a rising factorial, I'm going to get a falling factorial, still with the same number of terms. Okay, and let's simplify this again. What does this come to? Well, this is now the sum from n equals 0 to k of minus 1 to the k minus n, c of k n. And of course, if I multiply minus 1 by itself, I get 1. So this is just the rising factorials, or sorry, the falling factorials. And so if I I've put this together, what is this? This is exactly the Stirling numbers of the first kind. So this is the sum from k equals 0 of little s k n. Oh, sorry, I've somehow, <laughs> I've dropped my x to the n. It did not vanish. There, now it's back. Just in time for the grand finale. x minus 1, x, um, let's see if I can make a, a bit fewer typos here. Um, x minus k plus 1, x minus k plus 1. And so now you can see that what I'm doing is changing my basis this here is basis 1, and here we have basis 2. Whereas over here, I had basis 1, and here is basis 2. So the Stirling numbers, the reason that we get this lovely formula that the product of the matrices, when I think of them as matrices, is the identity, says that what I'm doing is something fundamentally algebraic. I'm changing bases between two very natural bases for polynomials. So this is, this is what I think is a remarkable fact, and this is the connection between the two kinds of Stirling numbers, and it's the reason that we want the signs to come up in Stirling numbers of the first kind.